only thing we can be sure of about the future is that it will be absolutely fantastic. Five, four, three, two, one. It is my pleasure to be joined uh, with a friend of mine, Greg Zuckerman, an author and writer. Oh, this is not picking up on. There's a book coming in here. This is uh, the man who <clears throat> solved the market, how Jim Simons launched the quant revolution. And I am Brian Keating, uh, co-director of the Arthur C. Clark Center for Human Imagination at UC San Diego's Arthur C. Clark Center for Human Imagination. Uh, and this is the Into the Impossible podcast based on one of Arthur C. Clarke's uh, laws. He had many laws, one of which you're probably familiar with, that any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. You've probably heard that before. <laughs> and then the, uh, another one is the only way to find out what's possible is to go a little bit beyond into the impossible. And so that's what we like to think of ourselves here. We talk with creative people, with folks all over the world in all different uh, genres, from uh, studies of the cosmos, near and dear to my heart, uh, to uh, business leaders, thought leaders, such as yourself, Julian Guthrie, we're going to have Peter Diamandis on soon, science fiction writers uh, like Annalie Newitz and David Brin. And, uh, and then sometimes we uh, do things that are just uh, of interest to me, like Krav Maga, the physics of Krav Maga. We did an episode on that. So uh, I want to uh, bring to people's attention that this book, which is a phenomenal book, and uh, not just because uh, you, you took an, ep uh, an epigraph, I was going to say epitaph, but there's <laughs> an epigraph, uh, chapter six, but you've also written many other books, and actually I came to know you, this isn't showing up super well, but we'll put a link to it, there it is. <clears throat> this is one of your other books written with uh, your two sons called Rising Above. This one's about inspiring women in sports, and you have another one, uh, Inspiring Men in Sports. And this are, these are wonderful books because they're really written for middle grade type um, audiences. And many of us have middle graders at home and we're running an unlicensed middle grade school as we speak. Uh, and so yeah. those books uh, tie in biography and sports and I think life lessons in a way that uh, are, are, you know, is, is sort of unique. And uh, I find it thematic of your work. So thank you, Greg, for joining us. And uh, well, It's great to be here. And I'm a yeah. big fan of your own book. So whoever hasn't uh, purchased a copy, I recommend it uh, just as an observer, not a science person myself. Um, but it was, uh, was eye-opening and educational and also enjoyable. Yeah, so I actually got a uh, an email from you when you were writing when I was writing my book, uh, and you were uh, you know asking some some interesting questions about the project that I'm involved with called the Simon's Observatory. And hopefully, we'll get to that. But I, I wanted to first take the opportunity. Uh, you may not know if you haven't listened to some of our podcast guests with authors. I never like to give away the uh, you know the the topic of the book too much in too much detail. The thesis of the book. Uh, in some cases. Uh, however, your book, because I don't want to compromise sales, you know, book sales, uh, because, you know, right. many authors rely on book sales. Uh, but I think in your case, uh, because your book was essentially number one uh, and still is in the top, you know, 10 or so on Amazon and, and other fine booksellers, uh, I think we will get into a little bit more of the nuts and bolts of your book. But first of all, congratulations on that. Uh, it's really Thank you. Not, not just in your category. Many of us have been number one in the, or some of us have been number one. I was delighted to be that way. But for you to be number one in all of Amazon, it's just such a phenomenal accomplishment. Uh, and no surprise, because your, your books are, are, are quite, quite uh, amazing to, to read. For, for, for the record, I think I only hit three on Amazon. So just for the record. Uh, okay. I'm, all right. Well, that's I'm a stickler true. when it comes to accuracy. But yeah. That's right. Okay. And you've had other books, of course, uh, in the business world. Of course, um, uh, this book written uh, not too long ago, this was also a uh, bestseller. This is called The Frackers. And this was uh, the kind of... Uh, just unbelievable story of how the United States really got to this preeminence and sort of wildcatting uh, and the, and the uh, exploration of natural resources, oil, gas, etc. And I should also mention for the audience who's not familiar with Greg, that he is also a special writer for the Wall Street Journal. And you've been there how, how long, Greg? Decades, right? I've been there since uh, 1996, actually, uh, coming wow. up on 24 years. Yeah, it's a, it's a long time to be at any one organization institutions so yeah they treat me well i like them so um i've stayed yeah it's a great great publication we are subscribers <clears throat> and we uh we always enjoy your writing and, and your compatriots over there Thank so you. i wanted to talk uh, about jim simons because he is uh he's sort of this uh in one sense very inscrutable character who has had 
at least three careers, three careers that he sort of is commonly associated with, first being math professor, uh, mathematician back in the 60s, 70s, and, and even the beginning of the 80s. The second one is as a, um, a hedge fund titan running one of the most, if not the most successful in terms of return on investment, hedge funds in history through his Renaissance Technologies hedge fund. Uh, and then the third career is sort of what he's obsessed with for the last couple of decades, along with his wife, Marilyn Simons, uh, <clears throat> is uh, running a large philanthropy, which is one of the largest, if not the largest philanthropies that supports uh, what we call pure scientific research. So this is research without the direct aim of coming up with a, with a drug or uh, you know, some new design for something. It's actually pure and apply, a pure research. So mathematics, computer science, qu- you know, quantum uh, quantum chemistry, quantum materials, things like that, and of course, cosmology, astrophysics that I study. Uh, and he's, I, I really think he's almost started a fourth career. And tell me if you agree, Greg, uh, with the Flatiron Institute. It's sort of, he's now like a college university founder. I mean, it's a think mm. tank, but it's, mm. but it's a huge enterprise. So let me, let me start with that. What, do you find the, the last of these four careers, you know, is, is that sort of out of place or is that in keeping with his visionary status in, in the preceding three different fields? Isn't just another challenge that falls along, cleaves along the same lines? Well, first I have to correct you. He actually had an earlier career that, um, wasn't long, wasn't, uh, many years, but he, it was a distinct career in that he was a code breaker, uh, right. during the cold war breaking code, uh, a la, you know, Alan Turing, some similarities um, against the Russians. And uh, that was another interesting, fascinating career. Right. Uh, as for this one, there's some similarities. You can, and, and, and it is a remarkable um, last leg uh, of his life in that he is tackling all kinds of big questions and in some ways big challenges. And I think that's what he enjoys. And Behind it all is it's what he, he's gone after what he enjoys doing. Um, math early on, people discouraged him. His family doctor kind of said, "Oh, you, you can't make any money uh, for focusing on math." And today he's worth twenty-three billion dollars and uh, uh, a major funder of, of political candidates and such. So uh, he was wrong there that the, the family doctor. Um, but in, in each of these car- um, legs of his career, it's something he's passionate about, but also. He likes taking on challenges, and today it's everything, as, as you know, um, trying to, and I'd love to kind of hear your thoughts in terms of the, the origins of life, which I find personally kind of fascinating, and that's an, it's another question that people have struggled with for years, for just like, and it's not so different from solving the market. I mean, for thousands of years, people have been trying to understand how to um, best competitors and figure out solutions and outsmart uh, rivals when it comes to beating the market. And Jim kind of has, and, but that was a similar kind of question. And these are lifelong questions others have struggled with and he takes on. And um, yeah, that's the Flatiron Institute to some extent too. You can make some similarities in, with Flatiron in terms of embracing data and being a scientist. He's always been a scientist and looking for patterns and looking when others kind of see chaos, he, he kind of looks for order. And I think that's what a scientist is, is trained to do to some extent. So I, I, there are a lot of similarities when it comes to all these legs in Jim Simon's career. Yeah. Yeah. And I think, you know, one thing that really characterizes him uh, is he's extremely uh, curious. I think the thing that he is most uh, you know, related to in my mind is his, you know, relentless curiosity. I mean, he calls it pondering. He calls it, uh, you know, sort of this deep thought that he has. Uh, but it's what's so amazing to me to see him and Marilyn both, they, you know, they can talk very deeply about aspects of experimental cosmology, detector development, um, you know, dark matter, dark energy. And then, you know, he can go pivot immediately and so can Marilyn into, you know, de novo uh, genetic, you know, uh, modifications, phenotypes, uh, um, epigenetic effects in autism to other other effects and, and differences between uh, sexes uh, in the animal kingdom. It's just phenomenal how how both, you know, broad and deep they, they both are. And I think Marilyn really, she's really, I think, his secret weapon because, you know, she, she's, you know, several years his junior, uh, incredibly uh, passionate herself and incredibly energetic. And uh, she she just has this relentless uh, 
spirit to pursue knowledge, uh, even, you know, catch her when she's, I think she's having a downtime, you know, just, you know, just doing, you know, kind of decompressing and she's doing a crossword puzzle in pen, you know, it's just, uh, it's really phenomenal to see how the two of them complement each other. And he hates yeah. puzzles as, as far as huh. I know. He's, he really doesn't like doing, you know, these solving these puzzles and games and stuff like that. Um, one thing that's interesting about Jim is that he's sort of an outsider. I mean, yes, he did work for the IDA and, and now we kind of associate, you know, the NSA as being, if not the biggest, probably one of the biggest employers of mathematicians in the whole planet. Uh, and so, you know, they're obviously involved in code breaking and forecasting, et cetera. Uh, I want to talk first about, you know, the Renaissance technologies. So when it started, I wonder, did people sort of, you know, laugh at that name? Or maybe you can talk about the etymology of the name. Uh, I, I know it, but but could you say, explain to the readers, what, you know, how does that come about? Why is it Renaissance technologies? And in what sense is it a technology? I mean, come on, it's just, you know, uh, computer trading, right? So in what sense is right. it really a technology? Sure, and why don't I kind of take a step back? A lot of your audience doesn't realize this guy, Jim Simons, um, mathematician, acclaimed mathematician, probably one of the most important geometers of the past 50, 100 years, um, has impact in worlds of mathematics, but also physics. He is the greatest moneymaker in the history of modern finance. And I use that term specifically. It's not clear. Is he a trader? Is he an investor? He's not an investor the way we traditionally um, de uh, define those kinds of people. But yet, yeah, his firm to this day is the most respected uh, on Wall Street. So um, I'm, th I'm sure many of your, in your audience know him from the world of science and mathematics, but uh, when it comes to trading and investing and making money uh, on Wall Street, there's no one like him. And he, in some ways, is a pioneer when it comes to um, developing mathematical models to trade, um, this quantitative approach, uh, computers as opposed to intuition and, and judgment. And getting to your question, so basically he gave up academia, gave up mathematics to some extent uh, in 1978 and said, you know what, I'm going to try my hand uh, at trading and investing. And it kind of goes to your point as being an outsider. When you talk to Jim, and I've been lucky enough to, to spend uh, time with him, and I've seen every interview and, and, and such, um, he sort of sees himself as an outsider in that even when he was in the world of mathematics, he sort of had one foot in that world, and he had the other world firmly uh, placed uh, in the real world, as it were. He was trading, he was investing, so he liked the markets, he couldn't always, didn't always have the time to focus on them, but he's very unique in that regard. He's also just an outsider in his personality, and you know better than I do, but... Um, Many mathematicians, I don't want to generalize or uh, stereotype, but they're not the most outgoing uh, sorts uh, usually or often. You know, the joke about mathema mathematicians is an outgoing one, is one who stares at your shoes as opposed to his or her own shoes <laughs> during a conversation. And again, it's a stereotype. It's not always the case. I've met many, many in the course of my research for the book, but uh, you can generalize to some extent often. And Jim's not like that. He um, is a guy you want to have a beer with. He is funny, mischievous, smokes like a chimney, uh, likes to drink. Uh, he's a funny guy, interesting guy. And, he, and he's, as, as you suggested earlier, he's curious about the world around him, about others, not focused on himself always. So he took an outsider's approach. And uh, for a while, though, in other words, he decided to embrace mathematical models. And it didn't work for a while. It went back and forth. And Getting to the name, Renaissance Technologies sort of suggests maybe a venture capital kind of firm, and that's because it was. Um, they were doing other kinds of things, and for a while, we're talking years, it wasn't clear if he was going to make it when it came to investing and trading, and maybe he'd have more success as a venture capitalist. So it took until really, I argue, 1990, from 1978 to 1990, they kind of turned the corner. But uh, as late as sort of 1988, 1989, he wasn't 100% focused on trading, and he was doing sort of this venture capital kind of uh, in, in investing kind of activity, which is suggested by the name. Yeah. Yeah. And I think, you know, what's, what's interesting with Jim is that he is very self-analytic. Uh, he understands what makes him tick, I think, better than anybody. And it's not so much that he does, you know, kind of have that chess playing poker playing, I think was his game, uh, mentality where he is sort of attuned as, as you, as you said, you know, he is, he has a secret edge, which I think is that his personality is one that's very sensitive. Uh, so 
We are supported, our research is supported on the Simons Observatory, obviously by the Simons Foundation. And, you know, just as an example of his leadership and, and, and as well as Maryland's, you know, within a few days after the COVID crisis really struck, you know, we got correspondence from the top down that, you know, they're, they're here to support us, you know, mentally, physically, you know, we have 300 people working on every continent, including Antarctica, as you know, uh, for this project. And just that he's so, uh, you know, deeply concerned with not, not how fast can we get back going and, and, you know, beat the competition or whatever, but, but really just about us as, as human beings. And I think he's always really noted that. I think he tailored his approach. You know, I asked him once, you know, how did you deal with these squabbles uh, amongst faculty? So he was the first uh, uh, chairman of the, of the faculty in mathematics at the uh, formerly known the State University of New York at Stony Brook. I believe now it's called Stony Brook University, uh, where he co-taught and actually you know, recruited my my late father James Axe to come from Cornell to work with him. Who was a who was a major character in my book? May I uh, yes. interject there? Yeah. Yes, he is, and I'm uh, thankful that his his legacy, you know, comes through in the book. Um, but when we talk about the uh, you know kind of personalities it takes to really deal with faculty. There's an old joke uh, amongst, amongst, you know, the academic set that, well, you know, the reason that academic squabbles in the faculty club are so intense is because the stakes are so low. Uh, <laughs> and if there's anyone who deals with high stakes, it's Jim or, ha- you know, has been uh, typically throughout his career, it was Jim. But in the case of, you know, faculty, I mean, I don't ask me, like, how did you, what was your leadership philosophy? You know, he told me something very interesting. He said, you know, a lot of you know, faculty, and I think this applies to corporations as well, faculty will get really wound up about stuff. And it could be that there's some legitimacy to that, that they actually have, you know, a good reason to be, you know, kind of enthused and passionate and squabbling about things. But it could be that you're just spinning their wheels. And he said, you know, I would have to, you know, quickly apprise the situation. Was it, you know, in category A or category B? And if it was in some aspect that I cared about, well, then I'd get involved. But most of the time, I wasn't as involved, and I let them hash it out. So he'd let them have these brutal, you know, back and forth battles, you know, for hours, mm. and then he would, you know, leave, be very hands off. And then when it was time for him to act, when there was something important to him, then he would say, and then he had accrued a lot of poker chips that he could go all in on. And I think it afforded him a lot of credibility with other faculty that he would both listen to them and that he would only speak when something was truly important. So people knew when he was speaking that, that Jim had, you know, deeply thought about the problem and that it was very meaningful for him. But he Mm. also allowed other people, um, intentionally to work on things for themselves and hash things out for themselves. I think that's a leadership style that, you know, I've tried to emulate as much as I can. The other thing, you know, that I took from him, I mean, famously, they're very secretive at Renaissance. I have no idea how things work, uh, over there. Never did. I only knew that they had this huge advanced stockpile of data actually dating back as you point out in the book, you know, perhaps hundreds of years, you know, shipping manifests of, you know, back to the, um, back to the, you know, 1700s or something in, in, uh, in the Malacca Straits of, of, you know, Malaysia or whatever. Uh, and that, you know, and they had these signals, as all hedge funds do, uh, that some are long-term, some are short-term. But um, I think it's ironic that for a firm that's so predicated on, on data analysis, and data crunching, that it's really not the machine learning aspect, it's more the psychology uh, that, that he, he came to be so adept at. And through his well, um, you know, well-schooled education in, in human dynamics and psychology, he has this ability to you know, calm people, whether it be investors, as you talk about in the book, during crises, and even his own employees, when they have these inter squabbles. So the book shines i think brightest of course i I, you know i like most of the stuff and i like the stuff about me and i'm not gonna be uh i'm not gonna deny that but it's a leadership book it's actually a i call it a stealth leadership book i've given it to a bunch of friends cosmologists why would a cosmologist care about this i think it's a stealth leadership book so was that your intention no and it's fascinating you say that because it didn't occur to me until i was done with the book that it is as much a management book as it is a trading book. And it's funny, you go on Amazon and I'm sure you know the, um, the feeling and you, you only focus on the, the bad reviews, the, the good right. ones uh, <laughs> you don't, c- don't really care about. I'll, I'll the, let you know when I get one. I'll let you know when yeah. I get one. No, I'm just <laughs> kidding. Yeah. You can look at mine. And most of mine bad ones are, well, yeah, it's a good story, Greg, but I want to learn how to be a billionaire myself. There are no formulas in here. Where are the formulas <laughs> that I can embrace? And the senior people 
executives, Wall Street types, but others too, who really enjoy the book, I think most of them pick up on that, that same theme that they've learned some management skills because that's what makes them so unique. I go around the country and I give speeches, or I used to until COVID. Yeah, right. and, um, and people are always kind of say, well, what's the secret sauce? What's the secret sauce of Renaissance? And they've got the greatest data and they've got computer and they've got the talent, et cetera. But I think the secret sauce is how Jim has managed that talent. How he's recruited it, and he goes back to Stony Brook, and the the there are skills, there there are, there are all kinds of te- techniques and tactics in which he's recruited. He recruited your father in a very unique way. He got your father, who was the youngest or one of the youngest tenured professors ever at Cornell, to leave Cornell for this sort of upstart, overlooked department at Stony Brook with uh, with Jim leading it. There was really no reason for him to have gone. And he had ways he was able to persuade people to leave their jobs. And he applied some of those techniques at Renaissance. And I think we could all kind of learn them too. But that is his ability to, he understands the quantitative approach. He is a mathematician. He can build algorithms. He enjoyed doing that both when he was a code breaker and, and later as well. But the, the key thing for for him is he can Talk, he can get people to work together. And maybe it's, it's like that in the world of academia. Maybe that isn't always. But that's been his approach that um, unlike every other firm, and I've been working on Wall Street, again, writing about Wall Street for 23 years, no one has an approach like Renaissance where people, hundreds of people, or at least for sure dozens of people work together at the firm. Every other firm, it's about silos. You make some discovery, you keep it for yourself. You don't share it with others. And Jim is <laughs> all about people working together. So there are all kinds of fascinating things that I learned about management, management techniques, and way to get super smart, talented, um, quirky, often stubborn, uh, frequently individuals to work together. Yeah, and exactly. So I, you know, again, you wouldn't think that a business tycoon would have lessons to teach a practicing cosmologist. Mm-hmm. But you know, here's another example. So Jim told me once that they're radically transparent within. Uh, within Renaissance technology, radically, uh, you know, kind of opaque outside. It's right? crazy. They are. Yeah. And it's kind of the opposite of even like Bridgewater. Ray Dalio is another famous, even, you know, maybe richer, you know, hedge fund titan. In his book, Principles, which is a wonderful book, you know, he talks about how they would videotape every single meeting. And if it didn't have something confidential or proprietary related to a trade, they would actually make it public. Um, so Jim didn't go quite that far, but he gave me a wonderful tip that I've used for the last 10 years. And that was, that all their meetings, they have a weekly meeting where they'd all go around and just talk about what they were working on, their trade ideas, their, their signal analysis ideas. And these are quants. You know, like you said, they, they're not typically you know, very, uh, very much uh, you know, comfortable getting out of their shelves. But everyone goes around, and it's similar with quantitative cosmologists, right? So they don't mm. want to do that anymore, but it brings them out. And the thing that we do in my group meeting every Friday is all my students go around the room. There's 30 of us and undergraduates, grad students, postdocs, other faculty. And we all say, what do we do this week? What challenges uh, do we face? Because it could be, well, I'm programming Python and I have this overflow, you know, this problem or that problem. Or, uh, and then, oh, I had that last year. You have to install this library. And, you know, it's something that I wouldn't have done. So I've recouped productivity, you know, time, hours, multiply by the IQ points of these people. Uh, and I think it's a lot. And, and, and of course, I think, you know, that, that lesson came from Jim. One thing that's kind of, you know, a little more enervating about Jim is that he, um, and maybe it's just his honesty, but he talks frequently, you know, very surprisingly for someone who's so quantitative, who's so data driven, he talks about the role of luck and how big a role it played in his life. And I wonder if you could comment, you know, does, does, it, does it seem as incongruous to you that this, you know, quantitative, literally quant, you know, it's the essence, the, the epitome of, 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 of reliability, forecasting, signal, you know, then he says, oh, most of life is luck. Well, uh, he's had a lot of bad luck. So yeah, I think true. he um, has, has had to uh, come to grips with that aspect. Um, I'm referring to it in his personal life. Uh, yes, he's worth $23 billion and has a gorgeous yacht, which I'm sure you've been on. I don't think I would never, as a journalist, I couldn't go on it. But uh, the super yacht is worth hundreds of millions of dollars. And as a um, happy marriage, uh, thankfully. Um, but he's also lost two children uh, at young ages. Uh, to fluke accidents, uh, one accidents? in which um, a son uh, was riding a bicycle and um, an elderly woman backed up and, and crushed him um, within seconds and the other in a diving accident. So um, I think he's had to confront the issue of, of, 
luck, be it good luck or bad luck in his life. And he frequently talks to people about uh, how he's had the, the high, seen the highs and lows uh, of life. And yes, they know they've got a really good sense of when they can make money and uh, they crunch, uh, they turn out some of the, the best returns Wall Street's ever seen year in, year out, even in this year. We're, we're taping this in uh, 2020 in the, uh, April, and um, uh, I'm giving you a scoop here right now, but uh, I haven't written it yet, but they continue to do really well this year as well. It's crazy. And yeah. yet, so, so, so right. It, you wouldn't think it's about, about luck, but uh, he's a worldly person and he's had to confront the issue of, of, of bad luck in his life as well. Yeah. Yeah. And I think the other thing that really, you know, kind of speaks to me about Jim is that he, he is comfortable being in so many different worlds, whether academia, like we talked about finance, but he has, he has no heirs. I mean, he's still this, you know, Boston, you know, kind of bread, a thick gravelly accent, uh, you know, cutting, cutting presents when he comes into the room. But, uh, I don't know if you watch the show billions on each on Showtime, do you? I don't. It's just too close to what I do day to day. So I just yeah. get away from it. But it's yeah, supposed I, to be very good. Yeah, I know. I, I never watched The Big Bang Theory. I mean, people ask oh, me about a, that. There's an axe. People ask me all the time about this character axe in, in the <laughs> TV show. That was your father's right. name. Exactly right. Yeah. It's, uh, luckily, it's, it's spelled differently. So I have no relation okay. to that, to okay. that particular act. Uh, but, you know, we've been watching it, my wife and I, you know, in COVID care, you know, kind of just, just the, the wind down at the end of the day. But, um, but you know, it's kind of, if, if there is, you know, reality, associated, and it's not, you know, not safe for, for viewing at the office, um, but, uh, but, you know, and it could be a little bit graphic for those of you. It's not for children, certainly. Um, <clears throat> but, but, you know, the cutthroat world depicted couldn't be farther from the Jim Simons that I know. Of course, you know, you can only know so much about a person, but he's intensely private on one side, uh, you know, and then on the other side, he has a, a you know, a multi-million view TED Talk about his life, which, which you know, and with Chris Anderson himself, you know, the father of TED. I wonder, how do you reconcile those two different aspects? I mean, one of his, you know, most often used quotes is from Animal Farm, you know, where the donkey is asked, you know, you're so lucky you have this tail, uh, uh, to keep away the flies. And he said, well, I'd rather not have the flies and not need the tail. And, you know, that's Jim's perspective. You know, I'd rather not have all this attention. And then, you know, he'll, he'll make a speech that'll bring down the house. So listen, uh, I think Jim Simons is a remarkable individual, a good person, uh, and I'm a cynical, skeptical journalist. But mm -hmm. uh, let's also be clear, one of his passions in life is money. He loves money. He's loved money from the day one. He's wanted to be wealth from day one. Uh, he, he doesn't throw his money around, but he enjoys finer things as well. He's got a nice home and, and uh, super yacht and all that. Um, so when it comes to money, he, he pursues it. And he always has. He's been very focused on that from the day one. And people close to him were, were never sure why. Some people family members and others and friends thought maybe he wanted the money. He, he knew he had to get really rich to have impact on society. And he's done that. Um, but you can make criticisms of him as well. So listen, one of the sad things for me is, as we struggle here trying to deal with this pandemic, that all this brain power is at hedge funds. They're trading mm -hmm. markets. They're trying to make a little money here, a little money there. And these guys are um, much smarter than I could, could ever be. And if we're looking for this is what they do they look for patterns Should, shouldn't some of that brain power be used potentially to, to find some of the patterns in, in what we're struggling with right now and it almost is sad to me at the end of the day that um they've siphoned off all this talent from your world from the world of academia from the world of medicine hypothetically to the world of trading which it's a net net it's it, you're taking money from somebody some other investor now they would counter and one could counter that well people like jim simons have made so much money they've gone on and done really great things with it they've multiplied it and you know bill gates has made the same argument and warren buffett and it's a strong argument um you could also make the argument that they've done other things with it robert mercer his 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 partner is the single most important individual i would argue to the rise of donald trump so these are also very complex individuals and, and i and i like that as as an author a lot of times people with my books especially a lot of people come away and they, they go like yeah greg i really like the book but i don't know if i like the characters and that's true of the frackers and the greatest trade ever and in this one as well and that's fine by me i personally think jim simons is one of the most remarkable fascinating characters and a good person but yeah. uh he, he, he he's not a saint either no, look, that's, as you said, that's your job. And, you know, I'm, I'm tempted, you know, again, to make you break your, 
your vow not to watch Billions because there are characters in there that, you know, one reminds me of you, you know, as this yeah. reporter for the journal, but they don't, that's like the Financial Street Journal or something. Yeah. Uh, but it's a guy who's like going after the billionaire hedge fund guy, but he's also got this side where he can be flipped and go for the state prosecutor, you know, the Southern District Prosecutor huh. paid by Jim. Anyway, you should watch it. But, but the point I'm getting at is Jim is not like that kind of chop shop or boiler room you know, kind of character. I'm not, and I'm not, I'm not, not just at purely defending it because you're talking about the field as a whole. I will say though, because I've asked him, you know, and in the, in the beginning, I had some students that were incredibly brilliant and they weren't suited for the world of academia by their own nature. And so I said, well, you know, maybe, uh, maybe instead of working on the Simons, you know, a telescope funded projects by the foundation, maybe you might like an introduction or maybe they asked me for an introduction to some of the contacts I had at Renaissance back in the day. I'm not super close with people at Renaissance anymore, but obviously Jim Simons is formally retired, but he's, um, you know, still an active member in terms of, you know, the ph- philosophy and, and, and maintenance of the funds. But he, um, he said to me, look, I'm not hi- We don't hire quants so much anymore. And I, I was kind of surprised, but I know, personally professors who dropped out of astronomy and went to go work for it. And, you know, to play devil's advocate to what you just said, I mean, he was, you know, his point was that eventually you get this phenomenon that you describe in the book with, you get like overmodeled. So it becomes like, there's only so much you can do. And you see this nowadays, uh, unfortunately, the incidents of COVID and forecasting, when's it going to peak, when's this resource going to peak? Um, you know, you can have a model for every person. Mm. The question is, you know, when you have only scientists working here, he told me that, that they were actually suffering in some, so they had some internal rubric or met, met, metric by which they were realizing that they actually needed some of these scientists to have some business knowledge. And they really didn't. They didn't understand the basics that an MBA would have fresh out of school, um, even though obviously an MBA can't do the same kind of uh, very high level quantitative mathematical approach that they do. Uh, and so I think he's moderated that. So I think there is less of that brain drain than you might think, uh, although there are still people there. Look, they're incredibly private. We don't really know what they do. Uh, but the bottom line is, um, you know, there's there's a balance. And I think, you know, some people want to do stuff in academia and then have it applied to the quote-unquote real world rather than, you know, letting these tools only be of use to some abstract, you know, abstruse calculation about the early universe, for example. But... I, I, yeah. I get your point. I, I do you can make the argument. Yeah. That it's, you know, it's interesting how he can be, you know, private on one side, public on, on the other side. Uh, I think, again, his overarching, you know, it's not like he's going to, another billion dollars is going to mean that much more to him as in a personal wealth. Like, you know, we always joke from that line in, um, in uh, Wall Street, you know, it's like, how many yachts can you water ski behind? You know, like, I, I've, you know, told that to my friends who are quants too. And it's like, how much money can you make? Fine. But he is devoted to this. And he wants the foundation, he's told me personally, he wants the foundation to last forever. That to me yeah. means he's, he's going to endow it uh, with the vast majority of his wealth and wealth generated by this engine of capitalism and argue about it as you like. But, but, you know, without which we wouldn't have these discoveries that, you know, he's, he is, you know, he thinks closing in on the first, you know, cures or treatments for autism as he closed the book with. Um, I, I found it very, um, very flattering that the things that he's most interested in in life are kind of those big questions on one hand, the origin of time, the origin of life, the origin of, you know, how matter came to be the kind of stuff that I study. And then this kind of stuff that's very practical for people that are suffering with, with diseases and conditions and maladies on earth. And he, you know, just as a, you know, kind of out there, I don't know if this is insider information, but he, you know, he invests in companies that are looking for cures, for example, for COVID and, and so forth. So I think, you know, and, and he has this huge repository of genetic information that people, you know, under his um, under his uh, supported organizations are working on. For example, in autism, building up databases for the first time, applying some of the quantitative techniques, you know, that, that are used in, in the quant field to, to this. So can we take yeah. a step back for, for listeners that aren't familiar with, you know, what is quantitative analysis? What is technical analysis? Is it just looking at, you know, the tea leaves or, you know, can you explain, give an explanation of what, what these things are? What, Sure. So I guess when Jim Simons began uh, trading, investing in a serious way, there were two approaches to making money. There was sort of the random walk uh, approach and the fish and market. You can talk about Chicago School, etc., where you can't really beat the market. If you see examples like a Warren Buffett, you know, that's like the 
the monkey writing Shakespeare kind of thing. And with the uh, random walk, the idea is you can't really predict future news, so you can't really predict, predict future prices. And the other view was that by doing research, traditional kind of uh, talking to approaches like talking to management, looking at financial reports, a la Warren Buffett and that kind of um, Peter Lynch approach, then you could beat the market. And Jim tried to completely, he embraced a completely different third approach, which was akin to technical analysis. And the people I spoke to who worked there in the 70s and 80s saw themselves as technical analysts. And just for your um, audience who don't know what that is, there is this kind of uh, um, ancient kind of approach where you look at charts and you build charts for the patterns of financial, any kind of financial instrument. And if you scrutinize it enough, uh, with the naked eye, even you can see potential patterns. And what Jim and his colleagues did was they said, "Well, we, we think there's some some order here to to the this chaotic market, and we're going to do it in a do technical analysis in a much more sophisticated way." And they became pioneers in this approach. And they're not the, they're not the only ones. There are people uh, not too far from you, Ed Thorpe in uh, Southern California. Um, a few others who embraced it early. And Jim wasn't the earliest, but he was an early pioneer. And they said, we're going to build uh, mathematical models. We're, gonna, we're also going to kind of um, try to trade and invest in a way that eliminates all the behavioral economics mistakes that we all have come to learn. And they, they, didn't, they didn't call behavioral economics back then, but all the mistakes, the dumb stuff, the, 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 the things we're apt to do, um, greed and fear and all the things in between. And Jim said, you know, we're going to let the computers, we're gonna turn, we, we, I want to turn it over to a computer. And part of it was just his un, being uncomfortable with traditional trading approaches. When he, the way he described it to me and to others is when I made a lot of money, I felt like a hero. When I lost money, I felt like a dope. You know, that whole kind of old school dope. You know, I don't think people say dope anymore. But um, <laughs> it's like positive. I think you're, I'm dope or whatever. Right. Um, not that I would know. But um, <laughs> Jim decided to take this other approach where we're going to turn the decisions over to the machines and create algorithms. And in so many ways, the reason, one of the reasons I wanted to write the book is Jim's obviously a pioneer when it comes to this quantitative approach, but he's also a pioneer when it comes to machine learning and artificial intelligence. They were doing this decades ago. Um, big data, they didn't call it big data, but they bought up all this data and cleaned it um, when no one was calling it cleaning it. You know, no one cared about that kind of thing. And no one cared about the data. He was buying data when no one cared about it. So it's a whole different approach that Wall Street and broader society has embraced. You know, Facebook and Amazon and your world and Netflix. And it's all predictive algorithms. And that's what these guys were doing, Jim Simons and his colleagues in the 1980s and, and 1990s. And some of the biggest breakthroughs, as, as people who read the book will see, weren't um, those that Jim Simons authored. And some people, that's another criticism of my book. Well, you, you see, you call it the man who solved the market. It's really the man. And that's true. It's not unlike um, Steve Jobs, who's the architect of, of, of and the genius behind Apple, but he also didn't come up with a lot of the breakthroughs. And that's similar to what Jim Simons, who's great, great taste. And you, you could probably speak to that. I heard a lot yeah. of professors uh, he worked with talk about, he was, he was a very smart guy, obviously, but they were amazed by his taste and he knew what kind of problems I think to, to, to tackle and what, what problems not to tackle. So in all those ways, he's, he's very much a, a pioneer that we can all learn, learn from. That's right. Yeah. I think, I think that is sort of the intangible, you know, secret, secret sauce that, that really separates people like him. And, you know, I think mm. there are other people, uh, you know, who, who might even be more financially successful, but in terms of, you know, stacking up these, these meta skills from, from, you know, the social psychology of working with these people to the pure technical and, and, you know, infinitely complex theoretical, um, you know, understanding that he has in terms of basic mathematics. But I think, again, what really, what I'll always associate with him is this relentless curiosity that he just, he just doesn't give up. He has to understand stuff. He's not afraid to ask questions, even if it makes him, you know, I mean, sometimes he'll, he'll ask you to explain something, you know, several different times and, and, and you'll lock in that he's trying to think of everything in terms of perhaps his first love, you know, geometry, you know, understanding things, mm -hmm. abstract spaces and, and even charts and technical, you know, graphs and, 
in quantitative analysis in terms of you know curvature and and derivatives and, and so forth uh, in a geometric sense, not in the financial sense. And it's almost like yeah, I mean, I didn't I didn't know so much about that before I read the book of his his younger sort of aspirations at you know wealth. But I, I don't ever get the sense it's wealth as a as a scorecard, the way that some people do approach wealth. I mean, conspicuous, you know, celebrity, you know, predicated on, you know, amassing more wealth than, than somebody else. I think it was pretty interesting, you know, when I was with him, we took him down over the summer last year in 2019, the Northern Hemisphere summer to the Simons Observatory site to do a groundbreaking and uh, of, the, of the future site and, and to visit the Simons Array, which is already operating at 17,000 feet above sea level. Now, this is a guy who has, you know, been smoking Merit cigarettes for the better part of the last 60 years and uh, is in his early 80s right now. And Going back know, to the whole theme of luck and, and how the are all luck plays, but go on, yeah. Right, yeah. So, you know, I had a lucky tried guy, to, yeah. you know, you know, station caches of oxygen and, you know, supplies. <laughs> and, and, you know, I'm one of my favorite pictures of getting him, like, shoveling you know, dirt at, at 17,500 feet. And he's just, you know, he just doesn't care. He just wants to do it. And then as soon as we were down below a safe altitude, you know, don't tell his doctor, I hope his doctor, I think his doctor is, you know, five years older than he is. But anyway, uh, we got the approval and, and he was, uh, he was, you know, he was healthier than I was. I and mean, he was uh, shoveling dirt and marching around yeah, the site. With yeah, a, yeah. He's a freak. He get him nature. to wear socks for the first time. I mean, yeah. He'd never, he had never put yeah. on socks before. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he is a freak of nature. He's uh, sharp as a tack. He's approaching 83. Um, he goes on hikes with uh, the Simons uh, Foundation and, and members there, younger people, and he's leading the pack. Um, but getting back to your earlier yeah. point, he, he considers himself a ponderer. And um, he said to me, he was in grad school, and he realized he wasn't the quickest. You know, he's accomplished so much in math and geometry, etc. But he doesn't consider himself to be the, the quickest mind. But He's, he, he, he gnaws at those problems. And even when he was a, a young kid, he, his mother sometimes had to get him out of the, a tree. He was in the tree just thinking for a long time. And he embraced these kind of menial jobs like sweeping in on the floor as I, I began my book talking about it. And he, he liked these menial jobs because it allowed him time to think. So he's a ponderer and um, just a fascinating mind, um, a beautiful mind in, in some many ways. Well, thank you for this book and the opportunity to chat. I'm sure things are super hectic on Wall Street. You you hinted at the you know that perhaps Jim is not uh, you know making out too poorly. He won't be you know downsizing to a, to a minor yacht instead of a mega yacht, a micro yacht. But um, uh, hopefully, hopefully the foundation is it remains uh, stable and, and continues to do the great work they do. Not only in cosmology, obviously that's my personal interest. But uh, the Flatiron Institute, which they support, and the uh, research, the uh, Simons Foundation Autism Research in, uh, Initiative, uh, you know, they support hundreds of millions of dollars in science, pure scientific research, not really yeah, looking at basic again. research. Basically, I mean, he's yeah. one of the biggest, like, two or three biggest funders of basic research uh, today. You know, you could argue, you know, maybe it's a shame that uh, it, it, it takes billionaires today to, to do that, to be responsible. But um, he's doing he, he objectively doing really great things with his money. Yeah, and I, and I think you know it's filling a niche that is done also in public private partnerships with the National Science Foundation. Yeah, you know, giving giving tons of money to to research to uh, to understand the cosmos and help the human beings get a better understanding of what the cosmos is all about. So I just want to close uh, by thanking you. Also mention your other books, The Frackers, Rising Above, two books written with your sons, um, <clears throat> Gabrielle and Elijah, who I've had the uh, p- pleasure to meet um, at your book launch party. That was really fun. Thank you for inviting Thank me. Thank you for coming. The book we discussed today is The Man Who Solved the Market, How Jim Simons Launched the Quant Revolution, written by uh, Greg Zuckerman. Uh, it's endorsed by Malcolm Gladwell, Michael Lewis, uh, it was uh, Muhammad Alarian, Edward Thorpe, and uh, I just want to ask, what, what are you working on now besides this, uh, the stuff for the for the journal? I've got my hands Look. full with journal stuff, um, market stuff. But what I'd love to do, I haven't really shared this with anyone. I'd love to write a story about whoever comes up with the vaccine. God willing, there is a vaccine for yeah. for for this to, that 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 has, stops this pandemic in, in its tracks. So. I like I like science. Um, at one point, I was really thinking about doing a book about immunotherapy, and um, the frackers got into some of the science, and obviously they got into the math with, with this book. But to, if I can, I, and I haven't really done any work with them, overwhelmed with work at, at the journal. But if if I could write a book about the individuals 
who find, figure out the treatments and the, the vaccine for COVID, uh, to, uh, I would, that, would, that would be a, a real pleasure and a, and a privilege. But let's see if I can figure that out. Yeah, I think I think you're absolutely right. I mean, it would make almost like a detective story, starting with right. the origin of the of the virus, the Chinese cooperation with the with the West, and and how we can uh, overcome this and, and avoid repetition of the 1918 yeah. flu. Uh, yeah. yeah, it's sort of, I, I like just, it might be interesting, might not be, but I do see, you know, there being some green shoots from this awful, tragic, you know, consequence, uh, the consequences of this pandemic, obviously every single life is, is an infinitely tragic loss, but, uh, but that it could be that what the Manhattan Project did for physics in the 20th mm. century and mathematics, and, you know, without that, there probably wouldn't have been a Jim Simons working at the ID, you know, the Cold War. Uh, that there may be a new century of, of biology, of biophysics, uh, hmm. certainly with all the great breakthroughs that are coming with CRISPR and, and, and so forth, and how we're now seeing how we you know, can cure diseases using viruses. I mean, it's unbelievable that the, the breakthroughs that my colleagues are making all around the world. So I would uh, definitely be interested in reading that. No doubt it would be another one. All of right, the best there you sellers. go. And, I'll come uh, back in uh, you know, a few years. We can do this again. That'll be awesome. All right, Greg, thank you so much, the, the Great man to who see solved you. the markets. And, and uh, well, if, your audience, well. if your audience wants to reach out, constructive criticism, I'm, I'd love to hear people's constructive criticism and email me, LinkedIn, Twitter, what have you. Yeah, we'll put, I'll put your Twitter and your LinkedIn profiles in the show notes. Uh, and That'd be we'll great. put it up on YouTube. And uh, thank you very much, Greg. All right, great seeing you, Ryan. Be well. Thank you. sure of about the future is that it will be absolutely fantastic. Five, four, three,